This is the second lecture in a series of lectures of the diseases of the respiratory system. In our previous class, we discussed the question of how do patients present, in other words, the symptoms patients present with when they have respiratory diseases. And we also discussed the common differential diagnosis of those symptoms. In today's lecture, we will discuss investigations for respiratory illness. We will not go deep into each and every condition, but rather this is a general overview of those investigations that you can carry out when you are presented with patients having diseases of the respiratory system. And among those investigations, we will begin with bronchoscopy. What's bronchoscopy? It is an endoscopic technique of visualizing the inside of the airway for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. Let's say we want to remove foreign body obstructing the airway using rigid bronchoscopy, then that becomes therapeutic purpose. And if we are using the bronchoscopy to obtain samples for biopsy, then that becomes diagnostic. In this procedure, a bronchoscope is inserted into the airway through the mouth or nose, and this allows the practitioner to examine the patient's airway for any abnormality. There are two types of bronchoscopy, the flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy and rigid bronchoscopy. The flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy is done under local anesthesia, and as compared to the rigid bronchoscopy, it causes less discomfort for the patient and the procedure can easily and safely be performed under moderate sedation. It is the technique of choice nowadays for most bronchoscopic procedures. It is used for diagnosis of structural abnormality of the airway, detection of foreign bodies, obtaining bronchial alveolar lavage samples for cell morphology and culture, and performing biopsy. Rigid bronchoscopy, on the other hand, requires general anesthesia and is commonly used for removal of foreign bodies or obtaining biopsy. Another important investigation is the pulmonary function test, which is an important tool for monitoring patients with respiratory illness. And since this procedure requires cooperation of the patient, these tests are usually performed above the age of seven to five years. And the commonly measured parameters are the first expiratory volume in first second, first vital capacity, and mid expiratory furrow rate. First vital capacity in one second is the volume of air exhaled in the first one second during first exhalation after maximal inspiration. And first vital capacity is the amount of air that can be forcibly exhaled from the lungs after taking the deepest breath possible. Normally, at least 80% of force vital capacity is exhaled in the first second. We can use these parameters to differentiate whether a disease process in the respiratory system is obstructive in nature or restrictive in nature. Normal force expiratory volume in one second to false vital capacity ratios between 0 0.8 and 1. In obstructive disease, for example, COPD or asthma, the ratio is reduced. In restrictive lung disease, the ratio of false expiratory volume in one second to false vital capacity is normal, but false vital capacity is reduced below 80% of the predicted value. Blood gas analysis has also a role to play. Estimation of blood pH and partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide gives an estimate of pulmonary functions. Arterial blood gas analysis is used for monitoring therapy in respiratory failure. Partial pressures of oxygen less than 60 mm of mercury and of carbon dioxide more than 50 mm of mercury suggest respiratory failure. Imaging techniques have also been used in the diagnosis of respiratory diseases. A standard radiograph and new tools like computerized tomography are non-invasive diagnostic methods. X-ray films help in the diagnosis of soft tissue and bony abnormalities, diagnosis of acute and chronic pulmonary infections. CT scans are used for visualization of lymph nodes, tumors, 
bronchiectasis and pleural pathologies. Finally, in condition like cystic fibrosis, estimation of sweat chloride values is done. In normal children, the normal values for sweat chloride is less than 40 milliequivalent per liter. Levels more than 60 milliequivalent per liter is seen in cystic fibrosis and values between 40 to 60 milliequivalent per liter are borderline and need to be repeated. Thanks for watching. In our next video of the series of the disorders of the respiratory system, uh, we will begin with congenital abnormality of the upper respiratory tract.